So in this video, we are going to be taking a look at the new Pro EQ3. So I've got some stems prepped over here, which I think are a really great example of how we can use the Pro EQ3. More specifically, I really wanna be looking at the dynamics section. So by a quick glance, it looks rather similar to what we're used to, but we have the ability to enable and disable the dynamics. We can either do this globally like this, or if I was to enable the dynamics on any one of these, um, it will automatically enable the view so we can see all of them. But if you don't wanna see anything, you can hide them but you still have them kind of enabled, if that makes any sense. We'll get to this in a moment. So to start off with, what is a dynamic EQ and how is it different than, uh, for example, a multiband compressor? Well, I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't know exactly how to answer that question because they're very, very similar. But what I will say is I first started using dynamic EQs at around 2015. And it was somebody by the name of Paul Drew. He's got an amazing YouTube channel with James Ivey called The Studio Rats. Uh, he's a really high level Studio One user and he's an amazing producer. I've learned so much from him in terms of mixing, production, just a lot of stuff in general. But it was a McDSP um, Dynamic EQ. I think it was called the AE400 or something like that. And basically what it allows you to do is sometimes we'll be looking at a signal and maybe in general, the signal sounds really, really good. And you want to do some basic contouring shaping where, you know, across the board, you say, well, it's a little bit heavy in this area, or it's a little bit too thick. So I want to make some kind of like some static EQ adjustments, like, like this type of thing. And it ends up being that that works across the board. But what happens when you take a look at a section where maybe the vocalist is leaning into the microphone and you really only have certain frequencies that become a problem as the vocalist hits a certain amplitude? Or maybe, like I said, maybe they're leaning in in their particular voice on that microphone and you're not using compression, that it causes the mic capsule to freak out a little bit. These are where dynamic EQs are really awesome because you can basically give it instructions based upon a threshold, a frequency, and a Q factor to say, all right, you only need to activate when this area is becoming a problem. So what I'm going to do is I've got a very specific uh, track chosen over here. This is just the instrumental print of drums. Whoops, this is bass, that's not drums at all. Let's go to this one, it's drums. Okay. Now, in general, I'm really happy with how the production and this mix turned out, but I was at a live festival um, in the summer and this track was played with these stems, basically these stems at Unity, maybe a little bit of a balance or something like that, but I heard this on a live system. And although it really sounded great, I thought to myself, oof, that 3.5K that 3 is just a little ice picky to my ears. So this would be a really great example of when I might want to use a dynamic EQ. So I've got a shortcut which just pulls up my uh, Pro EQ, or in this case Pro EQ 3, in its, in its default position, or its default preset rather. What I want to do is I want to activate a band. So I'm going to activate this band, and this is going to activate the dynamic section, and now we see the dynamics for everything. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to solo. Now notice over here that we have different ways. We have peaking and we have shelf. I'm gonna set this to peaking. Let's take a listen to this and let's sweep around these frequencies. I know it lives somewhere between like 3000 and 4500. And of course we can use our shift modifier to get fine control. Okay, maybe over here. The other thing I can do is I can adjust the Q width. Okay, so let's say that I'm fine with that as a starting point. So the first point, like I said, is you really need to fine tune your, if actually, you know what? I'm gonna use a different band. I don't wanna use this band. Let's set this one back to a shelf at 12 and let's set the frequency a little bit higher. I actually want to use uh, this band. I think it's this one over here. Ah, this band over here. This is going to be much better. So we're going to do the same thing again. We will just use the solo option. We'll dial up the Q. Now this, I might use this just to exaggerate it. And then I might kind of 
loosen up a bit or widen this up a bit. So now that we've found that frequency, here's the two things you have to keep in mind. Um, in terms of a static gain adjustment, if I wanted to either increase this or decrease this, I can still do that. We still have the ability to enter a static offset. And, so, and in some cases, you might want to actually boost something, but then have it be dynamic. And in some cases, you might want to cut it a little bit and then have it be dynamic as well. So what I'm going to do here is we're going to activate this dynamic section and I'm going to set a range and the range is basically giving a maximum amount that I want to allow this to duck. And I usually like to go with somewhere around, uh, we can go, for example, we can go to like, let's go to like minus six. Let's solo this out as well. And I'm going to pull this down and I'm basically going to do this until I start, until I start seeing some gain reduction. Okay, so that is set to minus eight, which is a bit too much. I'm gonna enter, let's enter like minus 6.5. Now notice that because I've set this maximum range that I could pull this down all the way and it's only ever gonna go to minus six, but it does it all the time. That might not necessarily be what I want. So I'm gonna set this and I'm gonna start pulling down this threshold bit by bit until it comes just at the parts that I want. Okay, another thing I can do, like I said, we can click the solo button, we can fine tune this cue. So this would be like, this would be particularly wide, come out of solo. But notice now I've lost the brightness. Now this is where we could, for example, do something like this, where we could increase this at the same cue, but then have it be dynamic. But in this case, I think what I'm going to do is go with something where we're going to um, make the cue a little tighter, something like that. And then I just want this to be applying like this. And then what I might do, I might give it a little bit of a bump because I am taking out quite a bit. So I might say, you know what? I want this to be like minus four tops. And then maybe we'll give this just a little bit of a bump in terms of our gain. So that's one approach, and that's the way that I use dynamic EQs most of the time. I'm dialing in a frequency, I'm setting a maximum range that I'm allowing this to be reduced. Uh, I'm adjusting the cue to get basically as wide or as narrow as I want, and then we're using the threshold. And then this be basically becomes like an automated EQ that will only cut when it exceeds a certain threshold. So that is one approach that we can take. Let's reset these parameters and let's mess around with this a little bit more. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, set everything back over here. Now let's um, make some range adjustments the other way. Take a look at what's happening here. This is really useful. So the way that I just explained it uh, in the first example would basically be that you have something and it's got a little bit too much edge and you wanna actually shave off that edge only when it becomes a problem and only when it exceeds a certain amount of, of, of a threshold-based setting. Then as soon as it passes that threshold, then we set a range for how much w that we want it to be reduced. Let's take a look at another example over here, which we just played. Let's say that, for example, I'm gonna just pretend, let's say that this sound on its own was actually very dull. We'll do something like this, maybe. So big difference here. Notice how we're losing all of that top end. In these cases, we can use the dynamic section in, a, in an, um, an upwards expansion type of way, which is basically it still is derived based on the threshold setting that we have, but this time we have a range that goes in the opposite direction. So I think I've gone a little bit too much here. Let's actually set this to minus six as our starting point. Let's, in order for sake of demonstration so that we can hear this, let's set the range to plus 10, which is gonna be four dB louder than what I'm cutting, essentially. And now I'm gonna pop this into the dynamic mode, and now we're gonna adjust this threshold. Pull it down.
Notice this is bypassed. And now this is engaged. So we have two different ways that we can work with the dynamic EQ. The first way is to shave or take the edge off of things. And this could be transient material like drums. This could be a vocal. This could be like a, like a bass guitar or a cello or an upright bass, something that has a really wonky frequency that's causing one specific area, like 640 hertz, to completely freak out in the room then you can just dial this in, right? We could say like, okay, well, which point is that? Okay, this one over here. So I could dial this in and say like, okay, you know what, let's just search for another frequency. This one over here. Okay, let's adjust our cue. Actually, there's a lot of knock there that I like. Let's find a different frequency. Okay, so I've dialed in the cue to find the frequency. We'll take it out of solo mode. We will activate the dynamic section. We will choose a range, in this case, minus 3.5, and this will allow that to be reduced by that amount. And we choose a threshold. Either we can be very gentle, which is that based on the loudness of that, it might be less or more, but it will be no more than minus 3.5. Let's change this to minus six. So you notice I've set this to minus six, but in this case, it's not necessarily going minus six, but as we bring down the threshold further, now it's going to minus six. If I pulled the threshold all the way down, it would essentially sit in minus six all the time. This is probably the way that I use it the most, but there is something to be said by using it the way that we're using in this section, which is setting a range in a positive value and then if you have something, if you have a performance where maybe you've got something and it's been over compressed, it's been flatlined, you're listening to a two mix, you're working on a mastering session. When you hear it, you want to hear a little bit more top end, but because it's been compressed so much, you're actually losing some of it. Then just go in this mode, right? Just find a way to make everything work together. Of course, we're faking this with a dynamic adjust or rather with a static adjustment to we're making it dull. But this might be actually what this needs, right? I'm going to actually deactivate this band for a moment. So in terms of our range and our frequency and our offsets, we could adjust this and make this work however we want it to work. Now, how is this different than a multiband compressor? <laughs> I don't know, I, but I find it 10 times easier to use in a multiband compressor. I don't know why that is. Um, I guess there, an argument could be made that you have a little bit more control with a multiband compressor in terms of uh, your attack and your release. And this is kind of just guesstimating. They've obviously baked in some sort of preferences underneath the hood over here where it's basically working in a way that is kind of intelligent based upon the different frequency ranges. Now, we were using this mode over here and we were using this, um, this mode over here in, in the peaking mode, right? But another thing that you can do is you can actually do a very similar thing to what we were doing. Let's make an adjustment here. So we have two different types of shelves. We have six and we have 12. Let's stick with the six for now. Sometimes if you want to just open up the upper end, the top end of something, this is something that we could do as well by, uh, by making these adjustments here. So what I'm going to do, we'll listen. Now, even though we have a shelf set, we're still listening with this kind of peak filter because it's doing its best to solo out this frequency. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give this an upward range of, let's say, um, for sake of demonstration, let's do like six so we can really hear what's happening here. And then again, we're activating the dynamics and we're gonna adjust this threshold. Now we're lifting that top end only when it's needed, and this is based on the actual threshold and the level at which this is coming in. Keep in mind, this can also be combined with other things, like for example, a high cut. And you say to yourself, well, why would you do a shelf into a high cut? Isn't that defeating the purpose? No, it's a way to smooth out and contour the top end of something. 
you really have to have a good set of monitors or a really great set of headphones to hear the nuances of this. But these are the tiny little things that make it so useful. Now, I'm showing you this on instrumental material, but make no mistake, these types of plugins or dynamic EQ in general on vocals is an absolute beast. This could be used to de-harsh something where somebody has a really specific buildup in the 3.5K range. It could also be used to add some girth or add some weight to a vocalist who just happens to sound thin on a particular microphone with maybe a really transparent preamp. When we go through tubes and, and compression and stuff, we can lift that, that area of the frequency response. But arguably, you could do the same thing by creating some sort of shelf over here and then engaging the dynamics mode and then saying, okay, you know, I want to give in certain areas, I want to give this a little bit of a boost. And this could either be a shelf or a, a peaking mode with a, with a very, very specific gain structure. And then it would be basically just dialing in the range amount and then based on the threshold. This is also a great way if you have something that it's weak, you have a loop, if you can find the fundamental low frequencies of a kick, you can use the upward expansion of a dynamic EQ to really make that low end cut through a little bit better in the mix. So this plugin, really, really powerful. Once you understand how it works and how you can use it in your mixes to solve different problems, it is super, super useful. In the next video, we're going to actually take a look at using it uh, with the sidechain mode because there's another level on top of this, which, which gives it even more use. So we'll catch you for more in the next video.